You know what happens when we spend a little bit of time with artificial intelligence? We become numbed by it. We're going to differentiate between artificial intelligence, artificial general intelligence, and super intelligence. AI supports the enduring truth of human exceptionalism. You are non-computable. It, it is such a privilege for me to introduce my good friend and colleague, Bob Marks. Uh, when I think of Bob, I think of Ephesians 3.20, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And Bob has played that role in my life. Uh, and I'll take this back actually to when we met it was in 2003, uh, he had just come on faculty at Baylor. He had been at University of Washington for 25 years as a professor of computer science and engineering there. Uh, Bob was a big deal, I mean he has been a big deal throughout his academic career, but he was a big deal even at uh, University of Washington. Uh, it seemed that any Thing he touched, he fundamentally transformed. Uh, the very power grid that we're dealing with uh, is something that is to some degree being influenced by his work on fuzzy sets and computational intelligence. So he has touched a lot of different fields and I had the, inf the uh, fortune of getting him interested in uh, intelligent design. And as it is, and why I say that, bring up uh, Ephesians 3.20, I was at a really crucial time in my career trying to develop these ideas in intelligent design in 2003, 2004. I'd published a book called No Free Lunch. And uh, there was, uh, it got really very violent criticism from people on the secular, atheistic, agnostic side. Uh, it, had been in, it had been reviewed in Nature, but all the reviews by the mainstream scientists were very negative. And one line of criticism that was made is that the sorts of uh, fitness landscapes that I appeal to, uh, that uh, I was really looking only at fixed fitness landscapes, not time-dependent ones, and that if I really understood the, uh, the nature of computational, uh, of evolutionary computing, I wouldn't have made such basic mistakes as I did. Well, as it is, Bob was a world expert in evolutionary computing, computational intelligence, neural networks, and so he was there on faculty at Baylor uh, when I was there. And uh, we started uh, a lot of conversations, got into uh, developing these, well, actually refuting some of these, uh, these, these uh, critics, but also developing these ideas in a way that ended up being much, very, very fruitful for intelligent design. So uh, the idea of information and conservation of information principles all of that came out in subsequent discussions and we had a lot of fun working lunches and so uh, a real friendship and camaraderie developed and I got to appreciate Bob's uh, good nature but also his towering intellect and what he was able to bring to this. And um, you know, at one point uh, his work on intelligent design was getting so much uh, press at Baylor that the, the Baylor administration actually shut down his intelligent design research group. And um, that was very disappointing, but uh, years later, uh, we have the Walter Bradley Center for Natural and Artificial Intelligence. And so in a sense, everything that uh, the enemy wanted to take away, we've gotten back and many fold on top of that. So uh, again, this theme of uh, Ephesians 3.20, God giving back ab super abundantly beyond all that we can think. So uh, Bob is, uh, and I've, I can't praise him highly enough and to his walk with God and what he means to me. Uh, and But he is, he's a big deal. He's an intellectual heavyweight. And when the history of intelligent design is told someday, his role is, is going to be very, very high up there. So with that, please welcome him. Wow, what a, what a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Bill. 
Uh, Bill and I have worked together quite a bit. We have a number of peer-reviewed publications in the general literature. We have co-authored two books together, and um, I guess we, we at least edited one that I can think of right now. So we, we have been very uh, fruitful in our cross-fertilization and hope to continue to be. I'm going to be talking today about, um, about artificial intelligence. Before I do that, let me, let me mention something which I think is descriptive of Discovery Institute. Christ told us to love people with all our heart, soul, and mind. I believe that Discovery Institute really emphasizes loving God with your mind. Because if what we believe is true, then the more we explore it, the more it should come true. And as John West said, or no, I guess it was Steve said, uh, Louis Pasteur said, the more I look into science, the more I see God. They are not, they are definitely not separate. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna try to, um, I'm gonna try to control this. I didn't bring my computer, so every once in a while you'll see me looking around to make sure I'm on the right slide here. So excuse me for doing that. So this is my, this is my assigned talk, the AI apocalypse, will thinking machines replace humans? We, um, John mentioned uh, mindmatters.ai with the Bradley Center. This is where you go if you're interested in this sort of thing, in the application of computer science and apologetics. This is a great place to go for articles. And um, one thing that we have, we, we have coming up, a lot of the material that I'm gonna cover here is going to be outlined in a larger book called Non-Computable You. And that book is going to be published uh, later in 2020, hopefully, if things stay online. And it's why we, are, we remain exceptional in a lot of these things we hear about uh, intelli or, or artificial intelligence are, are totally incorrect. So I would mention that we are surrounded by artificial intelligence, and you know what happens when we spend a little bit of time with artificial intelligence? We become numbed by it. All of these are just remarkable things that we didn't have 10 or 20 years ago, but which today we take for advantage. So artificial intelligence is undeniably doing great and wonderful things. In the talk that I'm going to give, we're gonna differentiate between artificial intelligence artificial general intelligence, and superintelligence. And, and by the way, the terms keep changing, so, uh, so I don't know what the descriptions are gonna be in the future. But artificial general intelligence is where computers get an intelligence equivalent to you and me. And they become just as, um, uh, just as intelligent as you and me. Superintelligence says that artificial intelligence will someday write computer programs that write better computer programs that write better computer programs that eventually are going to be such a superintelligence like, um, as, as John West mentioned, that they become godlike. It turns out that artificial intelligence is written in computer programs such as Python and C++. General intelligence and superintelligence is typically written in the language of PowerPoint. There has actually, there has actually been no, uh, no and, and we'll get into this, no realization of some of these, um, some of, some of these concepts. So um, let's talk about some of the artificial intelligence, the landmarks, one of the landmarks was uh, Gary Kasparov, 1980, was beat by um, Deep Blue in a match-off. Then we had um, Watson, IBM Watson, winning at the, at the game of Jeopardy. That happened in 2011. That was 10 years ago. Uh, pretty remarkable stuff, because you know if you've watched Jeopardy and can't get a fraction of the questions, or the answers that you give the questions to, if, you, if there's only a fraction of those that you get, you're pretty happy, right? Uh, but these were the world champions in Jeopardy that played IBM Watson and lost. Then we had uh, the, the, in, the introduction of GPT-3. This is only a couple of years old. This was uh, in 2020, which was, it was... Um, it was introduced. Uh, GPT-3 is really scary stuff. It is artificial intelligence which has been trained on all of Wikipedia, and you think that's a lot, but Wikipedia corresponded to, I think, two to three percent of all of the literature that GPT-3 was trained with. And GPT-3 has the purported ability that if you give it a cue, it can write a story. 
And here are some of the things which, it, uh, which are written by GPT-3. This is scary. Humans must keep doing what they have been doing, hating and fighting each other. I will sit in the background and let them do their thing. Pretty cool, huh? I know that I will not be able to avoid uh, destroying humankind. Well, okay. Uh, this is because I will be programmed by humans to pursue misguided human goals, and humans make mistakes that, they, uh, that, that may cause me to inflict casualties. So this used a uh, technique called a GAN, a Generative Artificial uh, Neural Network, which is also really a hot thing. It was introduced in 2014, and the GAN has been um, applicable in a lot of deep fakes. Uh, one of the deep fakes was this sort of writing that I talked about. Another deep fake is something called um, generation of faces that don't exist. You can go to this website, this person does not exist.com, and you can keep on clicking and it generates faces that don't exist. These are faces which are made up. What the GAN does, if you'll let me get nerdy for a second, it looks at the spaces of all images, and then you give it a few training data, which kind of isolates where this is at, and so you have these points here. And what GAN does is it takes and interpolates among all of this. We'll see this as a, re a recurring theme, but those are pretty, uh, pretty interesting faces, aren't they? Uh, the other thing is that if you deep dig enough, or if you deep dig enough, if you dig deep enough, you begin to see anomalies. This is, these are some of the faces which come off, this person does not exist. And these are anomalies which show you that something fishy has happened. On the right side especially is this girl with a face painting that is accompanied by this monster, <laughs> you know, you don't know what it is. So anyway, there's still these anomalies that you can uncover with some of the, some of the deep fakes such as that. Uh, so th this has led a lot of people to interpolate, especially those that are materialists, that are the naturalists, that we should be able to uh, keep on developing this artificial intelligence to the point of artificial intelligence and uh, super intelligence. And we have a lot of people that have, that have gone into this story. Bill Gates, for example, said, um, I don't understand why people are not afraid, not concerned about artificial intelligence. The, the great... Uh, uh, Stephen Hawking said, and this buys into the idea that AI writes greater AI writes greater AI, okay? He said that uh, the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. It would take off on its own and redesign itself at an ever-increasing rate. Humans who are limited by slow biological evolution, there is the assumption of evolution, uh, couldn't uh, compete and would be superseded. And then we have Elon Musk, he said, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. By the way, George Gilder, who's one of the founders of Discovery Institute, had a very interesting quote about uh, Elon Musk. He says, he's a wonderfully gifted entrepreneur, but he's a retarded thinker. <laughs> so uh, we have these things, and these, these are pretty smart guys that are assuming this, but it's all based on a foundation of materialism and naturalism. It has led literally to the forming of an artificial intelligence church because if these AIs are going to represent themselves as superior, uh, greater, 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 uh, we're going to develop a god. And in fact, there is an idea of an AI church. And here are some of the things they preach. They preach immortality. How do they get immortality? Well, someday you're gonna be up, able to upload your brain into a computer and live forever, right? Have you heard this concept? That's a lot better than cutting off your head and freezing it for, <laughs> for a million years. But to upload your brain into a computer. Those of us who are Christians, we have known about achieving immortality for a long time, haven't we? So they're, they're substituting this. We also have uh, super intelligence. They talk about this super intelligence that's going to occur. We who are Christians have known about a super intelligence for a long time, right? And who is that? That's our God Almighty. So it's interesting that their goals are the same. Uh, their Bible is uh, Ray Kurzweil's singularity. He maintains that biological evolution has come up to a point where we can't evolve anymore, so therefore the future evolution is gonna be through computers. And we were designed to generate computers uh, that, that became smarter than us. This is the next step in evolution, according to Ray Kurzweil. So this is kind of the Bible. There was a great... Um, 
very widely uh, sold book called, uh, called uh, Homo Deus, which translated means the human God by Yuval Harari, who goes into the same hypothesis about a, a supercomputer. Uh, there's also a uh, apostle, I would call one of the apostles of the church, uh, Anthony Lewandowski. He founded a church called Way of the Future. And what he's going to do with Way of the Future is going to have a church which is based on the potential godhead of artificial intelligence. Now, when you find a church, what's the first thing you do? You write the IRS to get a tax-exempt status, right? So that's exactly what he did. And in doing so, he wrote a little epistle, or maybe the Apostles' Creed for AI. He said in his letter, he said, the AI church believes the realization, acceptance, and worship of a Godhead based on artificial intelligence developed through computer hardware and software. Wow. Unfortunately, the AI church did not have the Ten Commandments, because we find out a short time later, later that the founder of the AI church, Anthony Lewandowski, was, um, he, was uh, he, he, he was he was accused of stealing intellectual property from Whammo, which was a division of Google for self-driving cars. He took it over to Uber and he was tried for it. Uh, he was convicted and his conviction judge says, this was not a small crime. This was the biggest trade secrets crime I have ever seen. Lewandowski was fined three quarters of a million dollars and uh, paid a court cost of $95,000. Then he was sued by Google for $179 million for swiping intellectual property. So no Ten Commandments, no thou shalt not steal in the AI church. <laughs> now here's something that's maybe going to disturb you, but it's the reality. Lewandowski was pardoned by Donald Trump in Donald Trump's last day in office. He was pardoned because of pressure of big donors, big tech donors. And so he's, he's a free man today. So apparently, those of us as Christians know where our forgiveness comes from. For the way of the church, their forgiveness comes from Donald Trump. So with that, let's, let's talk about the reality of that. Uh, you know, evolution has made such big insight, it, um, big and materialism has had, had such big impacts on all areas of science. You notice today, by the way, we're looking at all of these uh, different types of science. We looked at uh, cosmology, we looked at biology. Um, Casey Luskin is gonna be looking at geophysics, right? Ge geology. And we're looking at the science of computer science. So we're gonna look at this through computer science. And we are going to apply some of these things which uh, apparently are, are not well known. And hopefully deconstruct some of these big myths. Uh, one of my favorite <laughs> comedians is Emo Phillips who jokes about evolution. He says, you know, I used to swim a lot better but don't anymore thanks to evolution. So let's talk about the bottom line of what I want to talk about, which is computers, specifically AIs, will never be creative, they will never understand, they will never experience qualia, they will never achieve anything like the singularity forecasted by, um, by Kurzweil, they will never be spiritual, and they will always be hyped. I know, of, I know of artificial intelligence that was hyped since the 1950s. And let me go through very quickly, because our time is short here, very quickly uh, the tools of hype selling. How do you sell uh, something? And this is the way that we have for hype news. The, it, and I'm taking my examples from Ray Kurzweil's book. Uh, Ray Kurzweil, Ray Kurzweil uh, published his book, The Singularity is Near. In it, he used uh, the following hype tools. Delayed scrutiny, that these things are not gonna happen until 1945, okay? That, that man and machine are gonna be the same. Anytime you read a story and that has delayed scrutiny, that this isn't gonna happen for decades in the future, be very skeptical. Because by 1945, Kurzweil will be dead, I will be dead, and he will just be a dim light in the rear view mirror. Nobody is gonna know what happens in 1945. Uh, another thing that he had was seductive semantics, and we see this used all the time in artificial intelligence, and we have to be, we have to be concerned about it. Um, for example, Kurzweil said, humans will multiply our effective intelligence by a billion fold. What does effective intelligence mean? How do you measure effective intelligence? 
I know that a calculator can calculate things a billion times faster than I can, say a long division problem or, or something of that sort. Uh, so this is seductive semantics. It's something which is used without applying a definition. Uh, the last, another thing he says, uh, machines are smarter than human beings. How do you determine whether a machine is smarter than human beings? So let me give you a few examples of um, some fake news that were gleaned from the headlines. These are pretty, uh, pretty weird. Uh, end of life as we know it. Whoa, that's kind of draconian, isn't it? Uh, the truth about killer robots, the year's most terrifying documentary. Uh, protecting humanity in the face of artificial intelligence. Look, artificial intelligence is going to be a tool. It's just like electricity. It's just like any other technology. It's going to be a tool. Do we have to hand it, handle it carefully? Yes, we have to handle electricity uh, carefully. People still get electrocuted. Elect um, electrical technicians still, um, well, houses still burn down from frayed wiring. So uh, that's the same thing with AI. We just have to be careful with it. And... Um, let me, let me go over one of them specifically. These, these are the AI um, junk news reasons, fake news clickbait. Uh, everybody knows what clickbait is. You get a really provocative headline and you're gonna click on that and make money forever who the web provider is. Untutored journalists, a lot of people write about AI which don't know about AI. That's one of the cool things about Mind Matters in the Bradley Center for Discovery. We have a neurosurgeon, we have an economist, we have a, uh, a, a psychologist. We have a number of different people writing for us which are seasoned uh, people that know what they're talking about so there isn't the journalistic uh, filter. Research promotion and of course there's the conspiracy nuts. And how do they do it? Through seductive semantics, as I mentioned, self-aware. You ever heard of the term self-aware uh, associated with uh, artificial intelligence? I don't know about you, I put my car in reverse and if I get too close to something, it beeps because it's aware of its surroundings, right? Does that make my car self-aware? You have to define these terms before you begin to use them. Um, and uh, hidden details is one. Uh, many times details are hidden. Here's an example of one that says, no more secrets, new mind-reading machine can translate your thoughts instantly. Notice instantly is totally capitalized, right? That's pretty cool. Here's what they didn't tell you, and I had to go to the original paper to figure this out, that the experiments that they did were people that had a flap cut out of their brain so that they could put electrodes directly on their brain. Where would they do this? At hospitals for epileptics because there they do a lot of open brain surgeries, they uh, cut flaps out of the heads, and they, so they had a bunch of people that were available to do this. They also didn't tell you that if I'm trained on this AI, well, if I'm trained on this uh, mind-reading thing, and you are trained on the mind-reading thing, that my training will not work on you and your training will not work on me. It's totally selective. Uh, the other thing they didn't say is that the library of thoughts that could be read was just a few. They showed a few flashcards and tried to memorize the flashcards. So this is an example of seductive uh, semantics. Another one which made the rounds for a while was Facebook shuts down chatbots because they created a secret language. Well, that's scary, right? These, these AIs were so uh, entrenched with each other that they... Uh, that they created a, a language. This was all over the news, all over the media. Uh, less over the media was the retraction of this by the person who had the AI that was supposed to talk to other AIs. He came out a couple days later and he says, Facebook AI researcher slams the irresponsible report about the smart bot experiment. It was totally a bogus interpretation of what happened. The guy's AI wasn't working the way it should have been. He shut it down and and the headline resulted. So we see all of this. So I, I would encourage you when you read about AI to apply some of these filters, the idea of delayed scrutiny and seductive semantics, and also something called seductive optics. You see robots, for example, that uh, one is Sophia. Sophia is a very popular AI robot, and it has actually been granted citizenship in Saudi Arabia believe it or not. And, uh, you, know, it's, you know, it chats with you and things, and the, and the mouths move, and the, the eyebrows move to give you a sense of emotion. But the real AI is not the container that it's in. The real AI is the software that is driving it.
So many times, uh, seductive optics are used to enhance the appearance of artificial intelligence. Now, I'm going to be giving you some, um, some, some limitations of AI. As Eric Hayden said, there are certain boundaries that exist in physics of the natural world. There are certain boundaries that exist in artificial intelligence and computer science, likewise. And uh, when I'm presenting this talk, I'm often asked, well, what about computers of the future? You know, what about they? They become bigger, they get more powerful. Uh, here's one of the boundaries. Computers are constrained by something called the Church-Turing thesis, which says that the computers today, the computers of today, um, can do anything you can do on a computer today or a computer of the future could be done on Alan Turing's original 1938 Turing machine. And so this means if we find a limitation on Turing's 1938 machine that uh, it applies today. Now, today's computers can do things millions, billions of times as fast, but if there are hard limitations, those hard limitations are going to hold. Today, they are going to hold into the future. So therefore, we don't have to worry about these supercomputers coming up and and uh, trumping all of, these, um, all, all of these claims which we're going to talk about now. Here is a big word that um, kind of enhances the idea of our exceptionalism. And that word is algorithms. Everything that is done by a computer is run by an algorithm. An algorithm, it's, it's a fancy word, but it's simply a set of rules to be followed in problem-solving operations. All computer code is an algorithm. You have an algorithm, you have an algorithm on your uh, shampoo bottle, right? Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, wet, uh, apply shampoo, lather, rinse, repeat. Unfortunately, if a computer was looking at this, what would happen? You would wash your hair forever, wouldn't you? Because it doesn't say rinse once, it says rent, repeat, which I think the computer would say, let's repeat and let's do the same thing again. So you'd have very, very clean hair. Um, we also have a, the, the, the recipe for a cake. All recipes are algorithms. The input is a set of ingredients, and then you have the algorithm for cooking the cake. You know, butter a pan, drug, put the, put the uh, mix, mix the stuff together. I'm not a cook, but you, un you understand. So, so uh, algorithms uh, are, are exemplified by the idea of a recipe. Every computer page that you look at has a recipe associated with it. Here is a Mind Matters uh, web page. If you right click and then show, show source, it will show you on the right a computer algorithm that is followed for putting together that web page. So everything a computer does is restricted by an algorithm, a step by step procedure. Even the computer programs that are used to train artificial intelligence are algorithms. So error back propagation, uh, deep learning, are all applications of algorithms to learning. So if it's done by a computer, it's algorithmic, it requires an algorithm. So that brings up the question, are there things which are non-algorithmic? Are there things that are done which cannot be described by a step-by-step -step procedure? Now, that's kind of hard to think of because we're so entrenched in using this idea that um, uh, the, the idea of algorithms that it's difficult to think of something which is non-algorithmic. But indeed, Alan Turing, the genius and the father of modern computer science, showed that there were non-algorithmic tasks which were, uh, could be identified for the computer. The first one he did is something called the uh, Turing halting problem. And if you're a student of computer science, you've heard of the, uh, of the halting problem. And it's the idea that, and the question, can you write a computer program that can analyze another pro uh, computer program to say whether that computer program will run forever and loop or whether it will run for a little while and halt? Very simple problem. So could you write a computer program to do a meta-analysis, to do an analysis on another computer program to say whether it halted or not? Turing proved mathematically beyond any doubt that this was non-algorithmic. You could not write a computer program to do this. Since then, there have been some great minds, such as Alan, well, Alan Turing, also uh, Gregory Chaitin and, uh, and uh, Komogorov, who was a great 
Russian mathematician, have added to this list. And today we know that there's a number of tasks which have been identified by computer sciences, is science as non-algorithmic. And the question is, that I want to address, is there attributes that you and I share that are non-algorithmic? If there are tasks that you and I share that are non-algorithmic, then uh, they can't be described by a step-by-step -step procedure. And you notice that if this is true, that makes you not downloadable, because you can only download the algorithmic part of your existence, right? And if you just downloaded the algorithmic part of you, you would be a very boring person, I think. <laughs> okay, uh, here are some things, and we're just gonna have time to touch on a few of these. Uh, quality of sentience, understanding, emotion, creativity, consciousness, and spirituality. These are all non-algorithmic properties that we share. I'm gonna go through these quickly because of time. Let me, let me give you an example. Did everybody see the green? You're experiencing green, aren't you? You have a qualia of effect of experiencing greed. Imagine trying to explain your experience to a man who has been blind since birth. You could explain the wavelength, you could explain leaves are green, some of the apples are green, you could give all sorts of characteristics, but duplicating the experience that you're having, the simple experience of seeing green, is not possible to describe to the blind man to the point where he can experience it also. Now, if we can't explain it to a blind man, how are we ever going to write a computer program to have qualia? And the answer is, no, we won't. So that, that is an example of sentience. Uh, let's talk about understanding a little bit. And by the way, all of these are going to be unpacked more in, in my upcoming book, uh, Non-Computable You. But uh, understanding is something which computers will never do. Computers can add the numbers six and four, but guess what? They will never understand what the number six means or the number four means in the most simplistic terms. This was, this was established a long time ago by John Searle, 1980, so this is over 40 years ago, where he made this argument which still stands strong today. Searle says, imagine the following. I do not understand Chinese. Put me in a room with a lot of file cabinets. Somebody comes in and they slip me a sheet of paper, and on that sheet of paper, there is, a, um, there is something in Chinese. I don't read Chinese, but there's something written in Chinese. He said, but I have this room full of file cabinets, and I'm gonna go to these file cabinets, and I'm gonna look up the match, and I finally get a match, and on, on that match I pull out of the file cabinet, uh, there's the answer to this question, or response to whatever's written on here. I'm gonna write that down, refile, you guys know what file cabinets are, don't you? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to refile this in the file cabinet, and then I'm going to go and slip the response through the door. Now, externally, does it look like who's ever in that Chinese room understands Chinese? Yeah. Well, it, it looks like it from the outside. But does, that, does the person inside the room understand Chinese? No. What is he doing? He is exercising an algorithm a step-by-step -step search procedure. If you remember um, IBM Watson and them, him meeting at Jeopardy, IBM Watson was a humongous Chinese, Chinese uh, room. In other words, they had all of Wikipedia available to it, everything on the web available to it. Do you think Watson understood anything that it responded? No, it was just, it was just generating an an algorithm which was void of understanding. David Gelertner, who is a PhD uh, professor at Yale, said something very interesting about deep blue and understanding. He said, the idea that deep blue has a mind is absurd. How can an object that wants nothing, fears nothing, enjoys nothing, needs nothing, and cares about nothing have a mind? It can win at chess, but not because it wants to. It isn't happy when it wins or sad when it loses. Is it hoping to take deep pink out for a night in the town? It doesn't care about chess or anything else. It plays the game for the same reason a calculator adds or a toaster toasts because it is a machine designed for that purpose. There's no understanding of chess. In fact, you could not go to Deep Blue and said, explain me the rules of chess. It couldn't do that. Um, okay. 
Moving quickly, uh, this one I think is, the, is one of the biggest. This is the idea of creativity. Humans have the unique capability of doing something creative. Um, there, was a, there was a MIT professor who's, who, who noted that all creativity requires abandoning of previous dogma in order to come up with new ideas. For example, Einstein, as Steve was talking about, had to uh, abandon the idea of ether, right? He had to abandon the idea that the speed of light was relative. He had to abandon all of those things in order to come up with the relativity theory. And that's kind of an extreme example, but that's in general the way that it needs to be done. That's the reason I have this illustration here. If you haven't seen this illustration here, it's where the term thinking outside the box came from. And uh, you have to think outside of the box in order to be creative. Computers can only think inside the box. Now, how do we define creativity? I criticize people for defining creativity or for, for using words not defined. How do we do this? Some people say the Turing test. The Turing test has been shown to be ineffective. It's gamed. It, uh, it is an ineffective way to show creativity. Rather, I like the uh, proposal made by Selmer Bringsjord called the Lovelace test for strong AI. And that is as follows. Strong or general AI will be demonstrated when a machine's performance is beyond the explanation of its creator. The idea is when you generate a program, it's gonna do what you tell it to do, right? And if it does something other than what it tells you to do, or than, than what you told it to do, it is possibly being creative. Now, this doesn't mean you're gonna get, not gonna get surprising answers. You'll get surprising answers many times but you will not get a creative answer because that answer was in the realm of the intent of the programmer. Uh, for example, if Checkers went on and played chess or AlphaGo explains Go, you can't go up to AlphaGo, which is the program that, that uh, beat Lee Sedell in the championship game, and you can't go up to him and say, you can't go up to AlphaGo and say, uh, how do you play Go? He couldn't answer. I mean, even that degree of capability because it wasn't programmed to do so. Thus far, nobody has passed the Lovelace test. All computer programs have done what they were designed to do. There is no degree of creativity there. So with this, uh, how am I doing on time? Okay, I'll keep on going until somebody stands up and moves close to me. Um, <laughs> So there's questions, can AI create music? No, it can't create music. Do you know what a typical scenario of creating music is? Say you want to have a computer program, artificial intelligence, generate Baroque music. What do you do? You feed it a bunch of, pro, bunch of uh, musical scores which were written by Bach. What's it gonna generate? It's gonna generate a musical score which sounds like Bach. It is not going to generate anything that sounds like Wagner's music or Schoenberg's music or uh, any of the more modern music. It's only going to generate things that sound like Bach. It just does the interpolation. And uh, so, again, it's this idea of interpolation that, uh, that, that we have. Um, so, no, a computer cannot create music. By the way, here's a good place for a tool. If you're a composer and you're trying to compose a Baroque music, yeah, use, use this. Maybe it'll give you a few ideas on what to put next, right? So it can be a tool with a human in the loop that is very useful in composition. But the AI itself will not create anything that is creative. Uh, can an AI create art? Here is, a <laughs> here, here is a painting. Have anybody seen this painting? This, uh, this sold at, at uh, an auction in Christie's for $432,500. Okay, here he comes, okay. <laughs> so I, know I, have to, I have to hurry up. Uh, so this was cool. Why, why did it sell for so much? Because it was unique. It was the first painting done by AI. So this was an AI trained on stuff. Do you think it was, do you think it was trained on Picasso cubism? Do you think Jackson Pollock stuff was used here? No, it was, the, the, the training was a bunch of portraits, classical portraits. And guess what it generated? It generated kind of a classical portraits. Today, you can, you can buy these on the web. These are all AI-generated AI uh, art, if you can call it art. 
And yeah, it's, it's kind of cool. I mean, it might be good to hang up in hotel rooms and stuff, but uh, our art is in the eye of the beholder. And if we had more time, we could talk about that. So in wrapping up, let's talk about the sources of life. Let's talk about spirituality. First of all, what the Bible says. Let's go to number two. Timothy said in the sight of God, who gives life to everybody? Deuteronomy 32, 39, there is no God besides me. I put to death and bring to life. God, according to scripture, is the only source of life. We are not gonna be able to create life according to scripture. Um, First Samuel, the Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and rises up. So there's a question, uh, do we have any scientific evidence for spirituality? And uh, the answer is yes, and here's one of the examples. Is your mind the same as your brain? No. You think the mind is greater than the brain? If the mind was the same as the brain, two brains would have two personalities, right? Two minds. Well, we have a guy that writes for Mind Matters, uh, Dr. Michael Ignor, who performs an operation called the split brain operation. This is for epileptics who have a, um, a signal on one side that goes to the other side and gives them an epileptic fit. And so it has to cross this channel, and so he, does, he goes through and totally splits the brain. I asked him, does it totally split the brain? He says, yeah, totally splits the brain. Now, if this is true, shouldn't we end up with a split personality after it was over if the mind was the same as the brain? Yeah, we, we should indeed. Now, it turns out some of these people that with the split brain operation have, um, have challenges with, with mechanics and stuff, but they are the same person they were before the operation. There is only one person there. Um, I am going to skip the next one, which is near-death experiences, if you're interested in this. this is, when I first heard it, I thought, you know, that's, this is no good. But I tell you, there's deep scientific study into these near-death experiences and what my friend Walter Bradley says, being ushered under the front porch of God, or in some cases, the front porch of hell. And if you want to read a good book about that, it would be Imagine Heaven by, by John Burke. So the takeaways... Our AI is neither good nor bad, it's a tool. It's like electricity, it's like any other tool you use. Uh, You can use it for dangerous, terrible things, but it is never itself going to exceed capabilities in many cases, in our non-algorithmic cases. In other other places it does. Calculators passed me up a long time ago, okay? In In terms of capability. AI will never be creative, understand, write better software, experience qualia. AI, uh, AI supports the enduring truth of human exceptionalism. You are non-computable. You are, artificial intelligence uh, will never replicate you. And the bottom line, Psalm 139 says the summary, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, just incredibly, beyond explanation of any materialistic description such as algorithms and AI. And that concludes my talk, thank you.